We had in, before the break four excellent presentations and the four presentators are all members of the panel. We have two more panelists and I would like to clarify the, let's say, the game rules. Um, the two new uh, members of the panel who haven't had the opportunity yet to make a statement will be invited to make a short statement. And then I would like to uh, go to two main points. One is seen on this screen. Uh, after yesterday's presentation of Thomas, who talked about the Simpson paradox, I was a little bit afraid to put something, but this is global aggregate, so no real manipulation is done. Uh, I would say it's my favorite PowerPoint, not because I like it, but because I'm ashamed because of what is written on it. This is nothing else but the reality of the world in the early 21st century showing only problems which affect at least plus minus one billion people each. And if you look through this, you see that there could be multiple counts, and there are two lines, uh, the slum dwellers and the subsistence farmers, which are distinctly different groups, at least two billion people in the world, and plus other subgroups. So in grosso modo, we are probably not very inaccurate to say that as of now, one third of humanity is excluded from what we call sustainability, well-being, dignified human life or whatsoever. None of us is on this one third, and it's a little bit a problem that when we discuss it is always representatives of the two thirds are present and usually none of this one third. This picture will remain over the whole area because this is with the broadest brushes painted the social, political tensions and reality. This shows the drivers of migration. It shows the drivers of, of boredom. It shows a lot of things. And when I uh, distributed this picture among uh, some of the speakers, uh, Shandor wrote me back, the average GDP of the world is 12,000 US dollar per head per year. And under these circumstances, this should not exist. I fully agree, but it does exist. It means that we have a huge distributional problem. We have a huge political problem. We have whatsoever name you want to give. The second problem is also climate change and other challenges. And we have a framework, a framework which has been mentioned several times is the SDGs. And the SDGs, with all their limitations and constraints, is something the world agreed to. And this is what we can rub under the nose of policymakers. You said it in 2015, you want to achieve it. Please do your best that it is becoming a reality. So in this sense, the first person I would like to invite uh, to address uh, this uh, panel is uh, Kör Chaba Kuroshi, who used to be Hungary's ambassador to the UN and co-chair of the Open Working Group, which elaborated the SDG. So he could be called Mr. SDG, whether you like this uh, connotations, I do not know, but anyhow, he knows also not only the problems, but also all the constraints, con constraints uh, the UN system is working uh, with and working under, which led to this very valuable and important, but certainly not perfect tool and framework to act within. So Chaba, who is now a uh, director of the sustainability department of the Hungarian presidential office, which uh, for me shows also that these are issues which should be taken out from the prime line of the partisan political confrontations. Chaba, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janusz. Uh, I haven't heard this saying Mr. SDG or Mr. Target or whatever, uh, but uh, I'll think about it. Thank you much indeed for, uh, for putting it that way. Uh, but actually, if you don't mind, I would like to tell you about the stories of the SDGs or what is inside. It's 
can, it can be read. And anyway, it's three years back already. Let's look at uh, where we are now and where we are heading now. Uh, as we heard this morning, uh, the present development trajectory uh, of humankind uh, in global scale uh, producing more debts than values. Particularly if we take into consideration uh, the social content, the content in terms of uh, natural resources, and the content in terms of economic debts or financial debts, what we are accumulating. So obviously, what we need is to change the content and the trajectory of the development. I fully agree that sustainable development is about development. It's nothing less, nothing more, it's about development and it's about uh, transformation. Transformation where to? And that was the, uh, the, the subject of discussion uh, this morning. Uh, let me offer you uh, a not too new approach, but we still need to think about it. For the time being, when we talk about development, we mostly keep in mind something economic. Uh, for some, it is explained in terms of GDP, though GDP has never been created for measuring development. But we could have approach. And actually, let's come to the sustainable development philosophy. Instead of thinking about money, thinking about economic percentage only, let's keep in mind at least the five basic capitals or assets, if you wish, what we have and what we try to handle and keep in balance. The first is human capital. It's what you achieved personally, your health, your knowledge, your education, your abilities, and your capabilities. The second is our social capital. What we develop and exercise jointly together, including our culture, our language, our legal system, our institutions, our, uh, our ability to act together. The third is, not necessarily in this order, but the third is uh, the natural capital. Uh, it is the values the, uh, the nature is producing and we are using. Uh, this is the values what is able to renew itself. Uh, if we combine it with the human and social factors, uh, it creates us an opportunity to run our economies. Uh, and as one of the results of, the, of, the, of running our economies is the fourth type of capital, the built capital, short infrastructure, uh, or you can take it in a broad, broader sense. And certainly, last but not least, financial capital, that can be converted into any of the previous four. Uh, if we focus on one only, or if we, let me put it in this way, forget one of those, most probably the perspective of a balanced development for long run will be heavily undermined. Uh, my s uh, second uh, point uh, that I uh, tend to draw from, from, from the talks this morning, that our economies, our societies, and our uh, environment or nature or, or ecosystems create a unique system. Their fate is absolutely integrated. We can hardly separate, we can try, but basically it has never been separated and the moment we have forgotten about it, we run into trouble. So we have a systemic challenge, a systemic problem now, where we are seeing major problems in all three pillars of the development. Either we will be able to give an integrated answer or we'll be in a very difficult position. Uh, some of the speakers indicated uh, uh, on, the, on the screen the SDGs. 
and uh, they are absolutely right that it's a kind of compromise uh, one was politically possible and scientifically necessary. Uh, that, uh, that's life, uh, uh, I have to acknowledge. But let me also mention you that SDGs express a global vision that we agreed upon. They have never been created to be implemented in Arizona or in Budapest. Uh, the task is for all of us to, once we agreed on the global vision, to translate it into our national realities according to our heritage, uh, our priorities, our uh, actual challenges, our capabilities, level of development, so, and so on, and create the program, the way how to approach within 15 years, God forbid, or longer, uh, to be closer to what we, uh, we, we believe a more balanced, more sustainable way of handling the three pillars uh, of, the, of the development. What is missing? A lot. And unfortunately, uh, three years have passed already since the, uh, the global agreement. And uh, despite the fact that were put into equation supporting this vision, the Addis Ababa framework, which is about how we are going to finance it. The Paris Agreement, uh, which pinpointed the SDG 13 on climate, because it is, it is one of the most critical challenges humanity is facing now. Or the, the uh, Sendai framework, which is trying to address the, the natural disaster, because you have to to what you cannot change already. So despite those agreements and frameworks, three years after, uh, we can unfortunately can state that uh, on a number of SDGs, and in general, uh, we are further away from the goals after three years than we were in 20, 2015. We are definitely further away in terms of uh, natural resources, or SDGs related to natural resources. Uh, some of the speakers indicated that inequalities are rising in the world, both internationally and within societies, and they are not going to change unless there is a serious intervention, but that intervention mostly can be done in national context. We have no rules in international terms. Taxing, for example, Singapore, or taxing the United States or, 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 or Hungary uh, for, uh, to, to the favor of, of Uganda. Um, but uh, going too much into further, uh, there will be a debate-like uh, part of the discussion. Let me leave you with one suggestion. Um, so far, we feel where we would like to be. We know where we would like to be on certain areas. But what we don't have a mechanism how data, very broad variety of fields. We know, thank you, we, uh, in order to, uh, to assess where we are and where we are heading, having, where we are heading, we need to answer the question, what is the impact uh, of our actions? What is the impact of our planned actions, planned investments, uh, and planned programs, but we don't have the methodology and don't have the data how to pull together data related to energy, society, health, environment, economy. We have pretty good mechanism for each and every of them separately. But we don't really, we cannot offer a a more or less usable tool, even if it is a very general one or orienting one only, what will be the impact of your decision, Mr. Decision Maker, if you go this way or that way? They are very good attempts to make it, like the latest uh, uh, report of the IPCC, when they modeled of what is going to happen if we cross the 1.5 Celsius line and what should be done in order not to cross, what, what might be the economic consequences, environmental consequences, consequences, and some 
social consequences. But we really don't have the methodology, yes, and we don't have the platform, we don't have the institution that would have the, the task of developing uh, this, uh, this scientific tool. Uh, so for me, it would be one of the greatest outcome of this forum and maybe some, uh, some, uh, some other forum uh, in, the, in the months to come, if there would be a wish, a need and determination of start de developing the toolkit of integrating data for sustainable development. Uh, there will be huge changes in this world in terms of economy, in terms of environment, and consequently in terms of society. If we get prepared for that, irrespective if we get prepared for that or not. So it's up to us to decide whether we would like to drive those changes, or we would like to suffer the consequences of those changes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much for formulating one of the questions to the scientific community, which I believe overwhelmingly present in this room, and it is also a paramount question, what can science do uh, to succeed? And this was certainly one question coming uh, from your side, who is, if I may, identify another classification for your task, uh, preparing policy decisions. And this is certainly an uh, interface between uh, in the science policy dialogue. The second new member of the panel who did not uh, present in the first session is Professor Jörg Cepeli, Professor Emeritus of the Ötvös Loran uh, University in Budapest and senior uh, uh, scientist at IAS in Köseg. He is social psychologist and certainly his perspective on the morning session on sustainability and on the challenges ahead will come with the color of his uh, uh, professional background and experience. Thank you very much, Janos. As a member of the IASC family or community, this is not the first time that I am exposed to such a kind of discussion concerning the present and the future of the Earth. But I can tell you that uh, this morning for me was, a, uh, in a way, a decisive moment because now I realized that the problems are much more serious than we tend to think. So probably if there will be any outcome of this conference, I would propose uh, to formulate a manifesto, even I would say a cry for help manifesto, because I do not think that things could proceed as they had proceeded before. Therefore, we shall be very, we should be very, very uh, certain that uh, give a warning sign and this is not an early warning, but it's a warning sign, that if uh, things will uh, continue that way, then the end will be death. So um, when I heard these presentations, I just uh, thought about uh, the philosophical writings, the late philosophical writings of Martin Heidegger, who was uh, talking about, in the middle of the last century, about oblivion as a major characteristics of uh, the human society on Earth, and by oblivion, he meant forgetting of the meanings of life. And instead, what he uh, formulated, there is a kind of planetary idiotism, which means that idiotism is a kind of self, uh, um, self-concentration of all energies, but without meaning, without uh, perspective without transcendence and is becoming planetary and is becoming uh, uh, mech uh, how to say manipulative and controlling and supervising everything which is under the power so this kind of planetary uh, idiotism we have to somehow uh, go beyond because I do not think that if the system of the global organization uh, would remain then uh, sustainability can be achieved as a, as a goal so what we had to what we have to do somehow return to the beginnings and what is the beginning the beginning is the core value and I was extremely impressed by the uh, by the lecture of uh, professor of, <laughs> professor of, uh, uh, I, I assume that it's Chaba is somehow Hungarian. It sounds, sounded to me Hungarian. So, uh, Professor Chaba, uh, what he said that that uh, well, we we have to 
we, we, we have to concentrate on values. And what, what's the major value? The va major value is, 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 is life. So uh, probably if you realize that we are at the crossroads and uh, we formulate a manifesto, in the center of this manifesto we should put the value of life and against life is death. So probably my message in this panel would be that we have to formulate our statements in a more radical way. If we are not radical enough, I am afraid that we won't be taken seriously. And by radicalization, of course, I also do mean that we have to find the means of organizing, organizing ourselves. It's not enough if you have a radical message. It's what's important that this radicalization should extend beyond our not just scientific communities, but beyond all national and other sorts of communities, because it's a global problem. I wouldn't say that there is a need of global revolution, but something global movement is needed, and this is why I liked very much his approach, which was developed by Professor Chabai, because somehow I felt that, that his demand is to organize worldwide something against what we, have it, what we have now, and it was very well characterized by Shandor Kerekes. Therefore, we have to choose very simply, between life and death. That's all. And if we opt for life, then we have to pursue a radical organization, which, of course, is not just organizing, but raising awareness and educating. These two very important points, and also uh, Professor Chabai uh, uh, formulated. And probably the values based on the value of life, which we have to pursue, is two equality and solidarity. But I drawn as a conclusion that without this realization of these two major values, and not just in our national societies, but in the global society as well, then uh, the past won't lead us to life, but will lead us to death and destruction. Thank you. Linking your contribution to a former presentation of one of the other panelists with the first interactions within the panel. When we uh, listened in the first session on sustainability this morning, there was a very important word, I believe it was also in Ilan's presentation, co-design. It implies that none of us has all the stone of the uh, uh, wise man. Uh, we need a dialogue especially if we want to a global movement, a global change, a radical change. There is a lot of uh, co-fighters needed or uh, people with similar mentality and dedication. And I believe here is one group of this and the other group slightly bigger in numbers on the other side. So I would be very happy to open the discussion in a uh, question dialogue way, which could go between audience and panel and within the panel. So we heard a lot of good uh, uh, impetus uh, statements and presentations. What can science do? How could science contribute to this global movement? How to formulate the question life or death in a way that it appeals for action and not become a kind of hurdle to this action because to say it is anyhow too late, let's enjoy the last tw 20 years. I am with you, I am 73, <laughs> so I am in, in the party. Okay, the floor is yours and the response is yours. I don't believe that. Yeah, please. I mean, it's, I, I'm not there, but there is. I, 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 I want to maybe just elaborate something that's that's relevant here as a way to pull some of this together and that is uh the very astute observations that lina eleanor ostrom and um uh Oren young and others made about the governance of the commons in the as they saw it but i think it extends well beyond that and it has to do with how do we organize at a global level. And I absolutely agree we need it at a global level, but I don't think we can do it by organizing globally. Um, so the concept that they 
provided was the notion of polycentricity. And the meaning is that there are multiple localized, to one degree or another, efforts that can be quite successful in self-governing, in this case, for example, of resources in the community, but that it is very difficult to homogenize this and integrate it. And people keep talking about scaling up, and I always have images of people sitting there putting extra pixels in the map. Well, it doesn't work that way. What it does do is it allows us to look at networks. I didn't have time to talk about this before, but the point is that it's about these idiosyncratic nodes in the networks and how they communicate with one another. So we can have these separate nodes, whether that's Hungary and Kenya or US or whatever, whatever you want, but the scale has to be such that there can be social movements that become cohesive and that have strength. And one of the interesting pieces that have influenced me long time ago was a wonderful piece. Um, God, I'm dropping the author's name, but it was called The Strength of Weak Ties. And I'm sorry, Granovetter, right, sorry. Um, Thank you. And the idea that you can have a effective larger community network, but if it's so ingrown and tight, it can't spread very well in effect. So the point I'm trying to get to is that we have effective movements at the state level, at the community level, in, in various levels in different places. And I think we need to think about how can we s both support the development of those, but also support their net coherence so they do not wipe each other out. Thank you. Uh, you wanted to comment on the comment? Uh, thank you much indeed. Uh, for me, it's also a very crucial moment. What can we do? at a global scale, and what can, can we do at national or local scale? Uh, local scale. Uh, obviously, there are some critical challenges that you cannot address at your home or in your country only, like climate change. We all contribute to the challenges, problems, and solutions back at home, but basically we have one climate. And each and every action we are producing is giving an impact on the climate. So we collectively do have a responsibility. That's why we have an agreement. Uh, we have an agreement on climate. We have many agreements uh, regulating global goods. And maybe because I spend a considerable time uh, of my days in the communities of uh, different aspects of sustainable development, it seems to me that we have a vast network uh, globally and even nationally. But still, uh, we don't have the impact. And here comes the big question, how to turn knowledge into action? And uh, that is still a missing piece, or it does not go as quickly as, we, as, as it should. Uh, let me call for you the time factor. The academic discussions are very, very useful. They are clearing the way. They are, uh, they are determining basic concepts, positions. But time factor is more pressing than any time before. In terms of climate change, we have about a 10 to 12 years window. We can use those 10 to 12 years for discussing how to approach or how to determine, but then the window is closed. So please speed it up. Second, we may need common language on certain issues. Let me, let me come back to the climate change. It was mentioned uh, many times this morning. Climate change basically has been developed by whom? By physicists. And many, many thanks for them for that. Uh, just imagine 
what could have happened if from the very beginning at the table of development of climate, change, uh, climate science, uh, biologists, sociologi soci so sociologists, economists, historians would be sitting around the table. We would have today a different language, a different approach, and most probably different suggestions uh, how, to, how to tackle it. So it's still not too late to pull together knowledge to develop methodology, to determine what should be guided at a global level and what could be done at a local level. But the time is not working for us. Thank you. Thank you for a very enlightening informative set of presentations this morning. I learned a lot and uh, I found it uh, very helpful uh, to get this broad picture of the situation from all the experts. Uh, as I see it and what I take away from this uh, discussion are two questions. One is the question, what is to be done? And that is the easier of the two questions. The other question is, is there anyone to do it? And that is the real problem. And um, uh, le let me refer to one of my uh, favorite school of um, social philosophy, a somewhat obscure school of uh, philosophical thought in Britain around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and these authors, Green among them, um, argued that the purpose of state action is to hinder hindrances. It's a nice formulation, a dual negation, to hinder hindrances. The question is, what hinders us to hinder hindrances? And I think uh, what needs to be introduced, in spite of all the uh, references to polycentricity and Ostrom and uh, so on, is the concept of power, social power, uh, in the form of veto power, the hindrance to hinder hindrances. The veto power. Uh, let me illustrate this in the current German discussion on soft coal. Uh, the imperative of creating jobs or not losing jobs is being used as an effective argument to continue a highly uh, uh, dangerous uh, uh, climate dangerous uh, practice of burning uh, soft coal for uh, the purpose of winning electricity, right? In a massive scale. Um, so uh, it is relatively easy to, to see what hinders us to improve the situation. Uh, and you can enlarge the picture and I think we do need to address questions of social power, uh, both uh, concerning employment, but also concerning finance. Who is going to finance these uh, sustainability goals? Uh, and and uh, there are all the kinds of negative answers. And I think uh, in addition to thinking about social mobilization and social movements and uh, decentral local thinking and global effects and so on, which are all very, very much uh, needed in my view and, and uh, we should not continue to avoid the question of power in the form of veto power. Hello, um, good morning and 
Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm not a scientist, so I try to grasp some things will be of um, interest to me. Um, I have, I don't know if it's a question or comments to the four presenters. Um, the first is to Professor yeah, um, Andreas. Um, I, I was reading an article um, thing yesterday, and um, some scientists suggest that one way to combat um, global warming is to deflect the sun's light. So they propose sending a satellite with some stuff to deflect the sun's um, light from reaching the Earth. So I was wondering, um, will it really help? Will it lead to a reduction of um, greenhouse gas concentration? And the second, is, the second question goes to Professor Laszlo. Um, you mentioned energy sources and you cited dams. I was really struck by that because you mentioned that dams are uh, one, like, one of the best. But um, an article published, no, a report published in 2007 by one professor from the Brazil's National Institute of Space Research, it says that um, um, dams contribute to, la large dams contribute to 4% of total glo global warming impact. And I was wondering how you would reco uh, reconcile this with the fact that dams are really sustainable, and also given the fact that dams, after a certain period of time, their, their production capacity drops and they have to be decommissioned. And the third goes to um, Professor Ilian. Okay. Well, um, in your normative assertion, you said we live in an Anthropocene era. I think I have a problem with this term Anthropocene because when you say we live in an Anthropocene era, it means that the entire humanity is responsible for global warming or climate change. I would, in my opinion, I was thinking, how about we call it an oliganthropocene era, where in certain few, a certain number of people, I'm talking about corporations and those in power, are responsible for actually messing up the planet. Because if you go, for example, you go to the Amazon and you tell the indigenous people there that, hey, you guys are responsible for messing up this planet, they'll be like, what the hell are you talking about? And then um, the last is to Professor, Professor Kerekesh, Professor Sandro. I remember you told us in class that we should always question graphs and challenge them. In your presentation, you showed a, a graph about the population growth and you showed Sub-Saharan Africa. We have, of course, we have a high um, population growth, mm -hmm. but you mentioned that um, they have more kids because they are poor. Well, in my understanding, this is not how the people, we see it. We see kids as a source of social status and wealth. That means if you can take care of the kid, then you should have more. So I think, yeah, it doesn't sit well with the Western concept of, you know, poverty and population. Thank you. Thank you. Originally, I was tempted to collect more questions, but I did not have to find my process. And we have two very distinct group of questions, one coordinated, one source of focus, and now four questions to the whole presentation. So I would uh, give the word to the panel who wants to answer the first set of questions. What to be done? Yeah, I... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I am rather... I am sort of puzzled by the question that how dams are contributing to global warming. Grand sorry, sorry. Mm, that, uh, I think that was not to me. There, th not an easy uh, answer, but I think the, the short version 
is that this question of, of both power, which is, I agree, absolutely essential in this, um, it is a question also of where, at what scale and what level is power wielded, and what are the mechanisms that allow one to exert agency as a group in that. And one of the mechanisms, obviously, are the governmental structures, but many of them don't hinder the hindrances, they add to it. So that's where, at least in my, my sense, that the social movement characteristic, if it is able to exert a counter push power in the appropriate um, structure, which isn't always the case, but can be. And there are examples where that's the case. Um, I would cite, for example, California Clean Air Act. Um, that was really a pushback to the federal lack or the federal hindrances. Um, and there are probably many other examples. Um, I, I also want to quickly get to, because again, there, there are a lot of points to cover, but your, your question about knowledge to action. And my problem, and when I started the Knowledge Learning Societal Change Alliance, one of the real points was that we aren't talking about knowledge to action as if somehow you just jump over and you're on the other side. And you know the knowledge, now you do the thing. The problem is how you make meaning of that knowledge, how, what you do with that, and what agency you actually believe you have, and what responsibility. And it's the confluence of those things that I think shape what kinds of action might be taken. But, I mean, clearly we want to move across that spectrum, but there are a lot of pieces in between the knowledge and the action, and that's where we have to figure out how to bridge that in different, again, and I think it's contextually dependent. May I also try to address uh, this question? When we basically try to design a vis vision for the future and try to identify the problems, hindrances, um, we, uh, we have a strong temptation to let our minds go very free. And that's right. But let us never forget that these changes, processes, never happen in political or economic vacuum. They happen in this world, today and tomorrow, in the conditions what we are living in and what we are creating every day by our deeds. Uh, so uh, it was said that I had some modest responsibilities in the SDGs. Uh, so l I hope it will not sound what I'm going to tell you right now as a very cynical counter thesis for the SDGs. Uh, given the time frame what we have for a significant transformation, we are not going to be able to transform all economic and all social rules. Just a little. Those 15, 20 years are not enough unless we go for a serious revolution in our societies. And no one, none of us, is really uh, willing to see a, a major uh, upheaval, uh, a, a major eruption in our societies. So most probably what we are going to, to see, some communities, some cities, some countries will be more prepared than others, will be more, uh, uh, more equipped to reorganize themselves, to act together than others. What does it mean? In 20 years' time, the differences in terms of development, in terms of, uh, of survivability, these communities will have very different chances. So the difference, what we see, the inequalities, what we see today in the world, despite all the goals we have put in, fr in front of ourselves, as it looks today, set to grow. It's a very, very bad projection, but unfortunately that is the way we are, we are, we are following on. It was also meant who is going to finance it. 
uh, just roughly how much money are we talking about? What kind of investment are we talking about? Uh, a rough estimation through many financial institutions and, and, and knowledge-based institutions, we are talking about an, a, a volume of investment within 15 years, which would, would roughly equal to $90 trillion. It is about five times more than the, than the uh, GDP of the US today. But the good news is that it's not fresh money. You don't have to harvest $90, billion, uh, $90 trillion somewhere out there, but most of this money uh, is here, and we are using it, and we are investing it today. Just let's think about whether or not we should redirect the bulk of our investments, whether we open new coal mines and lock ourselves into this technology and investments for 50 years more, or we go for development of clean technologies. Uh, whether we further develop uh, the diesel engine cars or we go for a complete renewal uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a, tra a traffic system. Uh, the jobs, it was, uh, it was asked. Uh, I think economists more or less could answer this question already. And uh, uh, you may refer to the new climate economy which is published every year, basically. And there's very clear evidence uh, that if you really go for, uh, for uh, cleaner technologies, if you really go for cleaning your economies, you, you tend to produce more jobs than wha uh, wha what you lose. Uh, of course, it depends where your country will be. If your country uh, is sticking to the old technologies, most probably you are going to lose jobs only, not gaining too much. If your country can belong to those who are determined uh, to align to cleaner ways of organizing yourselves, most probably you are, you are, you are going to pr uh, produce more jobs. Last but not least, about geoengineering, please don't. Uh, all our activities, uh, economic and social activities, when, whether they are producing new values or they, they are, they are uh, consuming values, they produce externalities. And we don't count those externalities today. Uh, if we would be able to counterbalance uh, and put together the new values and the externalities what we produce, we could really uh, estimate whether or not we are further, further, uh, 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 further away down on the road or not. If we try to fix the problems, what actually we are producing every day, by engineering, re-engineering the mechanism of the Earth, I'm afraid we, we may produce much more problems, much more, much more challenges than that what, what, uh, what, uh, what, what we are tr uh, trying to fix. Uh, this mirrors in the uh, on, on the skies, or, or uh, putting a lot of, uh, uh, lot of iron to the seas, or spraying sulfur in the atmosphere, you have never ever seen any real analysis what will be the side effects uh, and kickbacks of, uh, of those, uh, those mechanisms. Let's try to minimize the negative impacts what we are doing now before we go for something absolutely uh, geoengineering new, uh, uh, new, uh, new methods would be don't really know where they would end up to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the four questions. Okay. Yeah, so regarding the water power stations, uh, they, uh, first of all, they don't emit anything uh, except uh, electric power. The dam itself uh, and the lake, which is uh, created uh, behind it usually, that doesn't decrease the green mass, rather it is increasing the green mass, which is uh, again good for uh, development and sustainability and also absorbing uh, CO2. So that's also a positive effect on climate. Um, so I, I am not familiar with the author and the publication you mentioned, but I don't know how a, a 
uh, them could uh, have any effect on climate. Furthermore, it has a good balancing effect, for example, in Hungary again, where you have nuclear power, which is steady, uh, continuous, massive energy production, but it doesn't uh, fit to the consumption. So the uh, water power station, which is well, can be regulated, is a perfect balancing effect, which is much more important than the relatively modest energy what the dam is producing. So if you know more concretely what effect you are referring to, maybe I can answer. I, I just want to make a clarification about the Anthropocene, because it's not about climate change. It's about humanity's change. And that started, if you wish, I mean, people argue about it, but in essence could start with the agricultural revolution. Um, the fact is that we have had, as humanity all over the world, in land use, in water access, in energy now, but there are any number of, for, I mean, forestation all over the world. So it is not simply the question of climate change and that which you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's very much a, uh, you know, th those who have been producing it uh, can argue about it, but it's, it's really much broader than that and much more complicated issue. But the, the question is, we, we humanity have a role in this. We aren't passive and nature isn't out there and we're here. It's the combined aspect of that. Just one short comment on uh, geoengineering. I agree with uh, Chaba that uh, I, uh, I think it's desperate. Any as attempt to, to do any sort of geoengineering is uh, desperate. So there is no way that, uh, that this should help. Uh, unfortunately, probably you remember, I criticized that graph and, and I didn't say that the problem is the overpopulation. I said they cannot achieve the goals because of the, of the, the people are poor, so the average uh, monthly income in that region 150 euro. In, in, in Europe, this is about more than 2,000. So it means that I was speaking about that, so I certainly I'm not against that I, I think so that to have kids, this is richness. question of life or death. My problem is how we try to approach the existing problems. Mainly we approach them from the output side. That means what we produce as a result. Uh, and even frequently, only a narrow part of the spectrum. Some people look at the uh, gases like CO2 and so on. Uh, I liked very much the idea to approach the problem from the solid state on. I did solid state physics for a long time. That means uh, emph emphasizing the importance of ice. If the Gulf Stream drops, then it, that's the end of Europe. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, it is very difficult to separate the general geographical processes from the human activity. Just stating that it is so fast that it has never happened before is not a scientific statement. So my proposal is to try to approach it from the input side, which is much more simple, uh, uh, on the resources side and so on. And there were some uh, elements of it. And one shouldn't forget the fundamental laws of physics, like the second law of thermodynamics. And I think that it would be much more simple if we, uh, we spoke about how we take the uh, privilege to spend 
the solar energy which was collected by our Earth in several million years in 100 years. If we started from that side, it would be much easier to explain it to the average citizen than to explain why the greenhouse effect is such and such and such. So my proposal is simply to try to, to, to solve the problem from the input side and not from the output side. I think it's been a great discussion, and I think the richness of it illustrates very clearly why it's so difficult. But I, I just want to point to three challenges, because if we can solve for those challenges, and I like Norbert's approach of focusing on the inputs and focusing on what can be done very much, but let's look at the challenges the way they're constructed at the moment. The first is, and let me just say, Amina's a friend and the SDGs are a highly significant achievement. But think about it. You've got a brain that can handle seven plus or minus two random alphanumeric characters in your short-term memory, like the cleverest of us in this room. <clears throat> You've got 17 goals, uh, and then depending on how you count them, either 244 or 232 indicators. 12 are overlapping between the goals, as you know. How do you process that? How do you develop a plan at any level to be able to address the scale of the complexity of that challenge? Now, we know what we're doing. We're developing fragmentary plans. We're developing focused plans. We're looking for inflection points. That's in the smartest of the environments in which we're planning for it. But it's an intrinsic challenge. It's not intended to be a criticism of the SDG process. It's just speaking, I think, to a dimension of the challenge. The second thing that I'd say, um, Ilan has already used the phrase in, I thought, a very elegant way. Uh, and, and let me just relate that to that extremely important picture that you have on the screen. Right? The, the scale of developing plans to tackle that is intrinsically enormous. Now, Ilan, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote what you said in respect to it, because I think it's an elegant quotation. You said that inescapable uncertainty in the context of complex systems, where the attribution of causality is inherently difficult, if not impossible, normative ambiguity and unintended consequences, or the world we have to live in when we're making policy <clears throat> to try to deal with these particular challenges. That's the problem. Now, if you then add to that the time frame, and just let's remember, apart from the SDGs in terms of Agenda 2030, we've now got the IPCC report in respect of a hard target of the radical diminution of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 in respect of this, whatever the merit of the concept of greenhouse gas emissions may be. Under those circumstances, the complexity of this problem is now almost transcendent, even on the national level, even on the local level. And then, as you correctly said at the beginning, some problems can only be solved through collective action at global scale. So figuring out how you solve for these challenges in terms of, I mean, we think it's a triadic system for whatever it's worth. We think certain issues have to be dealt with supranationally. Those are preeminently issues of tragedy of the commons and global public goods of enormous significance. Others are probably about defining normative coherence to develop national or regional approaches towards the same. And the third are probably just aligning aspirations or goals, and then leaving it essentially. But figuring out what's in what bucket, given the degree of complexity around these issues, is really scary. And you know, I, I don't have any solutions to these, I'm, so I'm tossing it out to all of you just as a response to everything that we've got to collectively deal with. Thank you very much. It's, again, the panel is challenged, and I'm extremely grateful for both contributions because implicitly they are uh, putting up the questions, what can science do? How can we change and uh, look into input-based approaches? And 
uh, how can we overcome uh, the limitations of this multi-criteria approach, seven plus minus two, instead of 17 plus minus <laughs> how many more? So the floor is yours. Jabba, you want to start? Please. Uh, thank you much. Very, very important and pertinent questions. Uh, they are so pertinent that they were there on the table since the very beginning of the negotiations on the SDGs. Uh, some were very much tempted to go into a kind of number game. Let it be 10, because you have 10 fingers, and you can easily count. Or let it be even less, so you can put it on a, on a fridge magnet. Or you can place them on a visit card. That will save the world. Uh, some others had different approaches. Uh, so instead of uh, re-diving into uh, that kind of discussion, let me pose you a question. Supposing you are a doctor, how many parameters of the human body you have to know in order to make a statement whether or not he or she is healthy? Most probably a few thousands. And you don't argue that, no, 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 I would be a better doctor to learn only 10 parameters. We need to take as many as needed. 17 is a kind of compromise among countries. Do you know which was the most difficult one to put as, a number, as the 17th in the line? Guess. No, it was climate change. Supposing, let's start taking off some of the SDGs from the table, climate change would have been the first to be missed. Uh, as a co-chair, I was rejected by the floor three times. Usually, when you are leading negotiations and once you are rejected, you don't come back. But, but uh, just imagine a sustainable vision for the future having no idea or no say about what are we going to do with the climate. Forget the rest. Uh, um, the question is, whom are we going to talk to if we would like to explain to the layman on the street Yes, it is obviously not 17 goals and 169 targets and 221 indicators. If you want to talk to economists or scientists, particularly addressing a bunch of integrated questions, you will need much more indicators than, 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 than 200. Uh, as at the big, very beginning, I, m I mentioned that uh, these 17 goals, or whatever number of goals, are expressing a global vision. None of our countries are going to implement those global, uh, that, that global vision uh, automatically. It has to be translated into national realities, traditions, according to priorities, and so on. If you wish, in the terms of Hungary, although, of course, we are party of the agreement, I think we need to create a national profile. National profiles of those that are the most burning questions, the most relevant questions for this society, this country, or those that are the most promising in terms of further development in the country, of course, in light of the general view of, of, of sustainability. What we are trying to pursue actually in, in my office, it's not more than five or six SDGs. Uh, not that the other 11 uh, would be irrelevant. Yes, they are rele uh, relevant. But you need an entry point to convince people. You need an entry point to convince businesses. You need the entry point to convince academia. Let's concentrate efforts. Let's concentrate resources in order to make a difference. Uh, it is not a homogeneous uh, set of big number of points and big, uh, big, uh, big, big number of commas. 
if we don't see the real task and the timing of the task for ourselves relevant to ourselves and our, our, our societies, then we are going to lose time. I just would like to repeat because I, I'm really uh, sure that uh, this is not up to us, but it's up to our children. And uh, without proper education, starting uh, from first class in elementary school, uh, they are condemned to, to destruction. So they have to uh, be raised in their awareness. And it's our task to, to transmit the message to the young generations because the earth be does belong to them and not to us. Thank you for that. I would certainly second that very enthusiastically. I would say in terms of learning across the whole lifespan, because if we don't reach the rest of the society, the education won't change either. Um, but what I did want to respond is Professor Crow's comments about the input side. And one approach to this, um, there's, we haven't talked about this, not necessary really, but it is a framework through the Future Earth community now, and there is specifically a knowledge action network, whatever that is, not deal with, on uh, systems of sustainable consumption and production. And what's important in that is the effort to think coherently about the relationship between the input and the output, and how one actually addresses that in terms of both the business community, the government sector, and taxation, finance, and the public, and the consumption, advertising, et cetera. That's one small piece of it, but it's actually maybe more fundamentally started with the whole question of the planetary boundaries and the, the resources. But the, I think much of the difficulty is that the understanding of those limitations and of those resources has not been effectively yet translated into actions with regard to those resources. And that's where I think we have a lot more thinking to do. First of all, thank you very, very much for the wonderful and very insightful and deep analysis and presentations, and um, also your enthusiasm and devotion, um, most of you who want change as fast as possible. Uh, I agree with those who say that the situation is severe, and um, I don't want to repeat all these arguments that we don't have time, etc. We have what we have. Well, I am also um, very moved um, that we have here um, Chaba Kuroshi, who, who is, speaks and acts as an activist. And that's very rare, coming from governmental circles. But it's also a good sign that things have started already changing. Um, well, um, I ask has a logo. Um, most of you know how to, <clears throat> uh, it is the nine dots puzzle, the nine dots uh, create a square, and the question is how to <clears throat> uh, put together all these nine dots, how to con connect them without lifting your pencil or pen <clears throat> with one move. And most of the people can can solve this because they, be they remain within the square, within the box, uh, only very creative people. I had one student from Ukraine once, a lady who got it immediately. Now, what, this is what we try to do. This is what we are I, at I ask, jumping out of boxes. But the problem is that these boxes are very numerous and very comfortable to be in. One of these boxes, it was mentioned several times, and the wonderful um, presentations yesterday, especially Sean Cleary talked about the global anarchy. 
<clears throat> that we are in a new geopolitical situation which is much more severe, dangerous, and hard to understand than what we had before 89. And the spiral is going down. <clears throat> it seems that <clears throat> irresponsible politicians, every day they're pushing down, pushing us down further and further. And many people understand that, but our institutions, and then I would name them, do not allow us and also comfort us to stay within the boxes. Who, who are, which institutions I'm talking about, or organization? First of all, the nation state. The gravest of our problems is the contradiction or paradox we are living within, namely a completely interlinked, interdependent economy, the global capitalist world economy, global economy, vis-a-vis -vis a fragmented political structure of power. And we have more and more small, <coughs> um, incapable, exposed so-called nation states with the bubble around head of politicians that they are sovereign. The craziness about sovereignty, the hundred percent national sovereignty, I don't want to <coughs> blame any of the small states. Could give a lot of, lot of examples. You know, falling apart structures in the last 20, 30 years from the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, it's going on and on, more and more fragmentation without um, social cohesion, without enough cooperation. Now let, uh, let me give some, oh, and other, other institutions, the academy. We jumped out at IASC from the academy. The academy um, where I worked, political science sociology, that they did not allow us to have this kind of debates. We were told with Elamir Honkish that this is, is not political science. Eight years ago. Just an example. Okay? The universities, can you, are you, do you know any universities who are organizing this kind of conversations, debates? A few. A few. In Hungary, I don't. Well, we should then, that's the problem, then again, the lack of interconnectedness. I would love to, to see these this examples, and I, as a director of the institute, I can promise that <coughs> we, would, we would jump into the network, the cooperation. Um, here, um, I was amazed how few people uh, were interested personally in this wonderful discussion. It's not easy to listen, physicists and biologists, but well, it's much more comfortable to, to stay in your box hmm? and write your next article and publish your next book with an academic publisher. So academia, universities, nation states, and our way of thinking, which is very much manipulated and grasped by consumerism. We live in a consumerist civilization, as many times repeated by Elamir Honkish, and also in a time of uncertainty where <clears throat> people are more or less uh, polarized and become more and more passive, even if they see the dangers. Now, this is the, I'm just, I, summarize what I heard yesterday and today, I did a few things. Now, this is the situation where you suggest to all of us to act. There were, um, and then I'm finished with this, um, to give you a, a metaphoric example, um, times when I was a student and I heard every day that don't jump around Ferenc because you can't change anything. We live in this, whatever we call it, Yalta system, Soviet domination, uh, uh, agreed upon with the United States. There's no reason to, to ask questions uh, uh, about how to change the world. And out of this sudden, we had popping up movements here and there. First, um, you know, irras irrationally, seemingly irrational revolutions like 56, and then a little bit more rational 68, and then, then, then a more uh, kind of um, thought, well thought over movement of Charter 77, and then came the Polish Solidarność when the working class with the intellectuals understood how to start to control power. First, how to push back power, how to, how to push power, state power, communist state power, into a dialogue, step by step. Nobody believed that, and nobody paid attention from the influential word. <coughs> um, I'm sorry if I repeat, so my students heard this probably several times. My, academic cultural shock was in, when in 89, the best universities of the United States, I was giving seminars as a little and beginner, 
<coughs> and telling big professors about changes coming in, in, in occurring in Eastern Central Europe. And I was told um, when they were a little kind of sympathetic, most of them were not, but just don't do anything, young man, you know. The Russian tanks are coming and we are not going to help you. That was in 89 March and April. In October, it's, it has changed a little bit. So what we have around our head is the conformity of our success stories. So we are ruling the world, um, or controlling half of the world. We don't care about small things. But these small things did contribute a lot to change. And the example of Solidarność, the way of thinking, yeah, not to provoke um, dictatorships that they could use, that they should start to use um, uh, armed forces and violence. That was a genius, small but genius idea. But similar examples can be brought together from East Germany, from former Yugoslavia. And there was a networking um, capacity which actually uh, was realized by, by most of the act understood and realized. So I'm a network guy. Um, this was the first network I entered was in 84, the European network of East-West dialogue. So that was the impossible, we tried the impossible. Most of the people, 84 and 85, thought it's completely crazy. You should not you know, waste your energy with crazy things. That was the message. Now, what I'm going to say is that it looks very, um, <coughs> how to say it, unlikely that small conferences, small um, institutions, or small organizations can uh, <coughs> cause, can um, trigger change, but it is not absolutely. Um, impossible. Um, so I, think, I don't think that states, governments can do it. Um, but it's a good thing that there are certain states and there are people in governments who, can, who are courageous enough to speak out. I think courage and intuition together are very, very important. Another example, I just came home the day before yesterday from Utrecht where Pax, the former Pax Christi is located. And they invited me after 25 years, we haven't been in touch with each other, uh, to talk about the dangers uh, Europe is facing. And uh, the, um, the game was that we should um, formulate scenarios in order to, to um, wake up the public. Negative and positive, but negative scenarios can <coughs> wake up the public. That was the idea. Um, because they believe that the European peace project is endangered. Is in, that the, the, the idea that there won't be any war anymore in Europe uh, cannot be held anymore, for sure. And interestingly, you know who came? They invited 40-something people from all of the countries. Only small countries in the peripheries showed up, plus one professor, lady professor from the United States. Greece, Serbia, Hungary, um, Finland, um, and yes, Belgium and, and Holland, because they were, we were there. The Germans, the French, the British were not. They decided not to come. It might change. What I'm saying is that there are, and there are other small, um, forgotten, um, insignificant, almost half-dead organizations, like um, the Pan-European Movement. It was another conference. Almost nobody showed up. And, and that's the, the, the arrogant way, you know, <coughs> uh, Mr. Hub, uh, Georg von Habsburg comes, gives a lecture, and leaves, no, not, no, not waiting for a question. Or, so that is still around how politicians behaved with us in the last 20 years in Hungary, famously. You could never have a dialogue with a prime minister or, a <coughs> or whoever, a minister, because he left the room before I opened my mouth. I was asked to come and, you know, ask questions. So there was no dialogue. Now, we have to find out how to start that. This is probably a first step, maybe awkward, maybe hmm, not so efficient, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> certainly, the media is not interested in publishing this news in Hungary anymore, in other countries, neither. And what I want to say is that we are responsible for this because we do have the tools, we are networked, we are connected. We don't use our, our means for the best purposes. Hmm? We have the Facebook, we have the social, social media, we have our connections, and it's not used efficiently. Um, 
well enough. So I think instead of just blaming, I mean, speaking against myself, the rigid structures, the fragmentation, all these conservative institutions, the technocrats, etc., 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 we should, and that was one of the conclusions, um, look in ourselves and, and, and ask what I can do so I belong to those people who call themselves an um, activist researcher and a researcher activist. But I really want to congratulate you because what you did was very thought-provoking, and I have a request to please send us your, your written, the written version of your paper, if possible, as soon as you can, that we can put it um, on our web, at least contribute a little bit <coughs> to the circulation of ideas. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes to go. It is, I believe, uh, we are very grateful for your summary and also for your actually one way of solution. You said networking and the responsibility. We are uh, uh, mandated with because we are networking and networkers and using these networks for generating more thoughts and more uh, ways for solutions. But uh, a panel discussion should not be ended by uh, such a nice note, so uh, I pass <laughs> it around. So you have all 1.5 minutes uh, to make a final statement. We have 10 more minutes to go, so it is six times, it's nine minutes, and then I have one minute. Okay, um, I got my, uh, I'm looking at my clock. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just quickly in terms of networks, and the, I, I understand and appreciate the challenge in smaller institutions in smaller countries to engage at the same level and with limited resources that some other places do. I will invite you broadly, and I don't mean just you or uh, I ask, but more generally, I'm in the middle of setting up, we, we are, we, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto, and the um, Arizona State University, but in my Washington office, are in the midst of putting together a program of science policy dialogues of a little bit different sort, meaning that it isn't just the policymaker who comes and gives a talk and people sit there and say, oh yes, not, or no, or whatever, but actually an engaged and a sequence of such events, which we will organize in Washington primarily, though perhaps also in Potsdam, for the purpose of using that as a common base to really raise the issues, not, not necessarily always the answers, but to really engage with the questions that we think we need to be put on the table and openly debated as here. So yes, there are other networks and other venues in which that can happen. I would like to, to recall uh, the last slide uh, shown by uh, Sándor Kerekes uh, about the value of the bees that are not giving us invoices. I think that uh, it's true, but if uh, the bees are gone, then there will be an invoice. And it will be much more than $190 billion. It will be, I think, end of the humanity or something. So I think that this is a very good uh, metaphor to, to, to show the danger of, uh, of the world that we are, we are living. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we have a very important ally, and this is technology, ICT, and I think that we have to use ICT in every means uh, in order to, to transmit the message. I liked very much your idea of uh, completing databases, because without data, certainly, we cannot communicate uh, in effect. And also, uh, without developing applications for the young, younger generations, which uh, help them to, to be aware of uh, the importance of sustainability, uh, this is also what we can do and to help them. Thank you very much. Uh, we can and we will keep debating the status of our Earth, describing global processes and trying to understand these global processes. But we don't have too much time to stay on that level. We have to come down 
please ask yourselves as an academic community, what can I and my academic community bring to the table? Be it on the data integration, be it on a different perspective of organizing our economies and creating values. It is the time to deliver. That, that window is very, very narrow now. If we miss the first five to six years, when we have to take the serious decisions, then we will regret it for decades. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with the uh, comment that uh, in uh, uh, the 17 goals uh, are different and they should be realized and they should have different emphasis in different countries. In the case of the energy, energy is uh, essentially a natural resource and uh, quite obviously, uh, many different countries have many different external conditions and that should not be forgotten. So not this, what I discussed is obviously not valid for every single country, but it should be adapted to the situation of a given country, uh, like the water energy which was asked uh, is uh, in uh, Austria and in Germany, it is almost 100% exploited, while uh, this on the same Danube, actually Hungary is the only one which doesn't have any nuclear power station, and the same applies to, for example, Norway and the Nordic countries. They still have lots of lots of uh, uh, possibility to exploit uh, water energy, and actually Norway is saturated with uh, water power. Sweden has much less, but has ten nuclear reactors, and this optimal effect is collaborating with the nuclear reactors which are providing constant power and, uh, uh, and uh, water energy which can be regulated at will makes a, a good uh, network between the two countries and a very stable situation. Now comes the uh, on higher levels like the organization between countries and social and political conditions that is sometimes even more complicated because the those are not so clear as the natural resources. And uh, again, in the field of energy, the Nordic countries has a, has a system of exchanging energy, which is called Nord Pool Spot, which is based on the differences in prices, every country even divided into ge geographical domains, and then they, every domain has a different price, and then there is a stock market type of exchange, which works very nicely. Now, the European Union, based again on the German initiative, has a, a pamphlet or some wishful thinking which says Energy Union, which, contrary to the Nordic system, tries to make a uniform uh, uh, energy price for everybody and transfer in that way, which would be certainly advantageous to Germany, with a, uh, which is uh, usually having the highest uh, price due to the very expensive windmill. Uh, installations. So that is, that is again a, a, a difficulty in reaching the global or more international uh, goals uh, in how to adjust these two systems. And this is already not a natural science question, this is somehow a political or society question or economic question, so that, that, that it is not always very easy to satisfy those goals. <laughs> so, uh, I think so that we have enough uh, money. So, Piketty would suggest to have about 80% uh, profit tax. If we would implement it, you know, that then we would have enough money to solve the problems. We have the technologies as well. And certainly the, the diversity, you know, that and the resilience is, is important. So, the small is beautiful. Don't we don't need to mainstream everything and we don't need to react everywhere in the same way. So this is what would be important. It's not so dangerous. Small is beautiful. Thank you very much uh, for this thoughtful uh, tour de force at the end of uh, the panel discussion. Uh, we had different opinions, uh, different approaches and it means that sustainability is very much context-related. I was very happy to hear that uh, Chaba Kuroshi, who was uh, um, helping to 
the birth of 17 SDG said Hungary concentrates on five or six. And if on different scales, different emphasis is set, it is a question that the, like an orchestra, the different voices, the different tunes, it's, it's an inspiration of the Musicology Institute, uh, can make a beautiful concert where at the very end we may uh, together sing the uh, joy of Beethoven Nights. Thank you very much and enjoy uh, the lunch, which is a part of your personal sustainability for the afternoon. Okay.